While NASA flies the International Space Station some 240 miles above Earth, it is also operating a mission 63 feet below the surface of the Atlantic Ocean. NEMO is the NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations Program, and it has its 16th crew on board the Aquarius Research Habitat off the coast of Key Largo, Florida right now. This time they're simulating a visit to an asteroid, building on lessons learned from NEMO 15 to test solutions to the engineering challenges that will be faced on such a mission. One member of NEMO 15 is also on NEMO 16, and he's with us now to provide an update on the mission. Dr. Steve Squires is a professor of astronomy at Cornell University, is chairman of the NASA Advisory Council, and is also principal investigator for the science payloads on the Mars Exploration Rovers. Steve, since we can see you, would you explain where you are in the habitat and, and tell us how much space there is to accommodate you and your crewmates? Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, right now I'm in what we call the main lock. This is kind of our primary area for any kind of group activities, eating, food preparation, that sort of stuff. Uh, this is where we have our daily briefings and that kind of thing. Aquarius is a pretty cozy place. It's roughly the size of a school bus, maybe even a little smaller than that. Uh, six people in here for two weeks. We get to know each other pretty well. So it's a small volume, but it's certainly more than adequate for what we're doing down here. I mentioned that this mission is intended to simulate a visit to an asteroid. For starters, is, is the size of the habitat and the isolation important to that simulation? Yeah, I think it is important in that simulation. Uh, when a crew goes to an asteroid, uh, it's going to be a, a small vehicle. Uh, they're going to be in tight quarters, maybe in tighter than what we're in here. Um, and yeah, the isolation is a big part of it. We're doing most of this mission with a 50-second time delay between us and mission control. Uh, when a crew goes to an asteroid, they're going to be so far from Earth that it might take 10, 20, 50, 60 seconds for a radio signal traveling at the speed of light to get to that asteroid and, and to that crew and then a comparable time to get back. And so we're simulating that and that does provide a real sense of isolation while we're down here. Now, that uh, communications delay is one of the primary things that you folks are, are looking at here. Is, is a 50, five, zero second communications delay, is that what you've been working on throughout? Yeah, we've been using 50 seconds for almost all of the mission. We had one day where we were doing some emergency scenarios where we would have a simulated emergency on board, a need to interact with, say, a doctor, a flight surgeon on the ground. And uh, for some of those, we, one of those we did a five minute time delay and one of those we did a 10 minute time delay. And it really isolates you. Um, you know, if you've got a very dynamic emergency situation going on and, you know, you try to talk to mission control and you get an answer back 20 minutes later, you're basically on your own. Well, have, I was wondering, have you found that talking, you, you change how you talk to mission control because of those delays and the way they talk to you? It has changed things. Yeah, yeah, it has changed things quite a bit. Um, when you are talking to them, typically what you'll do is you'll say, Mission Control, it's Aquarius, we'll have a message coming to you in 10 seconds. That way they've got 10 seconds to kind of get ready, get a heads up, know that a message is coming. Uh, we find ourselves using text a lot. Uh, texting is a good way to, uh, to communicate back and forth when you have a time delay. It's, it's very much like texting in any other setting. So uh, yeah, our, our interactions with Mission Control are different. They're also more limited. There's not as much back and forth because again, if we're doing a simulated spacewalk, which is a pretty dynamic thing, rather than them, you know, sort of talking to us constantly as we're doing the job, uh, most of the communications is just within those of us down here, the crew members who are outside, crew members who was uh, who was inside the habitat. You find you do you take things upon yourselves more rather than asking for permission or help. Yeah, and it, it's, it be, simply becomes necessary to take more initiative. And I think that's uh, very representative of what's going to happen to a crew that goes to an asteroid, a crew that goes to Mars. Anybody who goes far from home, you're going to be much more, uh, you're going to have to be much more independent. The communications delays, as well as the crew size, are, are two of the main areas of focus for your mission. The, the third one is restraint and translation techniques. Can you tell me why that's applicable, particularly to an asteroid mission? You know, honestly, I think that's the most important, most crucial thing that we're doing down here. Uh, when you get to an asteroid, you're going to be going to an object that's small. 
I mean, most of the asteroids that we're talking about sending crews to are at most a kilometer or two inside. They're little size. They're little objects. What that mean is, means is they effectively have no gravity. So you're doing a spacewalk. You're in zero G when you're interacting with these things. Now, we have lots of experience with crew members doing spacewalks, for example, outside the International Space Station, but asteroids don't have handrails. Asteroids are bumpy, irregular, unpredictable surfaces, um, and so how you do scientific exploration in zero G on the surface of an asteroid is something that no one knows how to do. And really what this mission is about primarily is learning how to do that. And so we're trying a whole bunch of different techniques for moving, for anchoring ourselves, for moving around once we're anchored down onto the surface, uh, positioning ourselves, things that we call worksite stabilization, getting into a stable environment where you can interact with the surface. Uh, we're trying out a bunch of those techniques to see what works well and what doesn't. Can you give me a couple of few examples of what you've been doing out there? How you've been trying to simulate that? Sure. Um, one thing that we assume, and we don't know how this is going to actually happen, but we'll assume that some kind of anchoring technique can be developed where you can fasten something solidly to the asteroid surface. So then imagine if you've got a couple of anchor points, you can string a, a line, effectively a tight rope, between them. We call that a translation line, and you can move over hand over hand, you can tether yourself to it to keep yourself safely in place. And so that's an example of one kind of translation technique that we would use. Now those Another things, things have been done on the space station before and on space shuttle, the, the translating along that line. It, we haven't had to... Yeah, the difference is you have to have you have to put that line in place yourself because the asteroid doesn't provide it for you. Um, another thing that we're using are what we call jet packs, but basically it's a it's a back mounted thruster package that you can use to translate that you can use to fly around. Those are great for covering long distances very, very quickly. Very, very good. But of course once you get to a work site, you've got no way to stabilize yourself. You have you know, if you hit a rock with a hammer, you're just gonna go drifting off into space. One that we all like very much is we have these small submarines down here, uh, one-person submarines, and what those do is they simulate a small space exploration vehicle that you can take with you to an asteroid, um, and you can use those to position what's called a foot restraint. This is something you can clip your feet into, gives you a solid, stable platform that the submarine will take you to the position you want to be at, will settle into a stable configuration. You clip your feet into this foot restraint, you got both hands free, and then you just go to work. And uh, that's turned out to be a very effective technique. I, I would imagine that the difficulty comes in making the submarine hold its position then. Yeah, uh, having the, whole, the submarine hold its position would be the hard part. The way you would do that in space is you would do it with a position and hold capability on the attitude control system on the spacecraft. So it is using thrusters to stabilize itself and keep itself solidly in place. The way we do it, the way we simulate that in, with the submarines is they just simply settle down onto the bottom. And, and you hope that you can count on that on the asteroid? Well, you're not going to be able to settle down onto the asteroid. The asteroid doesn't have gravity to hold you in place. So when you get to the asteroid, you're going to have to depend on the spacecraft to be able to position itself and hold itself in place. And so now we've got a set of specific requirements that we can give to engineers and say, okay, we need a spacecraft that can do this. We haven't mentioned it specifically, but uh, I assume that you're going outside on dives to, to simulate the working in weightlessness. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so we're doing simulated spacewalks. Uh, as we speak right now, there's one underway. I don't know, maybe you can even hear it in the background. Uh, Kimi Yui and uh, Dottie Metcalf Lindenberger are outside simulating a spacewalk right now while I'm talking to you. Uh, we do two simulated spacewalks per day. Uh, we send two crew members out at a time, typically for about three, three and a half hours. So we do one pair out in the morning, one pair out in the afternoon. I mentioned that you were a member of the previous NEMO crew. Can you give me a sense of how some of the lessons that you and your previous crewmates learned are being explored or, or examined or, or exploited on this mission? Yeah, we, we learned an enormous amount on uh, NEMO 15, my previous uh, experience down here, and that has all been put into action on NEMO 16. On NEMO 15, for example, we did have translation lines, but they were little flimsy things. Imagine a, a clothesline kind of thing, and they were floppy and you couldn't really stabilize off of them. 
it wasn't a good way to move or to, to, to stabilize yourself once you moved around. So lesson learned from that one, we've got basically really tight, tightly tensioned climbing ropes effectively that we can use to move around, and those are those are far superior uh, to what we used on, on Nemo 15. The tools for collecting samples are all better. Um, great deal that we learned. Now the other thing that happened on Nemo 15 is Nemo 15 we had a hurricane. A hurricane came through and uh, a mission that was supposed to be 12 or 13 days long got cut short after just six days. So on Nemo 15 we never got to even try out the submarine stuff. And so that's been a big lesson learned on this mission is the value of working with those, uh, those small spacecraft that are simulated by the submarines. On the subject of submarines, um, you had a blog post that you just published about your work with submarines. Nemo 16 has been making a big effort uh, with a lot of different social media outlets and live video streams to share the mission with people. Um, how did the submission go yesterday? Or, or two days ago? I think, uh, yeah, I, you know, I think yesterday and the day before, uh, you know, I got to do Nemo 15, Nemo 16. I think the past two days have been the, the best two days of, uh, of Nemo that I've ever experienced. Um, you know, one of our uh, habitat technicians down here is uh, James Talasek. Uh, James, is a, James is an incredibly experienced diver. He's got 20 years of professional dive experience, uh, 12 years down here at Aquarius. He said that yesterday was the most complicated thing he's ever tried, seen anybody try to do in the water. Uh, we had two submarines in the water. We had uh, two aquanauts out on jet packs. We had at some point nine, 10, 11 different support divers in the water managing tethers, managing umbilicals. And we just nailed it. Everything went right. We got everything done. We collected all the data. I think we've definitively shown uh, how well that combination of submarines and jet packs works. Um, it's, it's been a, just a, a fantastic mission, and the last two days in particular have just been, for me, the high point of, of both of my NEMO missions together. What's left on the agenda for this flight? What else do you folks have to do before you come up at the end of the week? Well, we've got two more days worth of EVAs today and tomorrow, uh, two more days of simulated spacewalks. And the nice thing is at this point we've learned so much that now now we can try other things that we ha might, might not have thought of before. I wouldn't call it quite improvisation, but it's experimentation. When, before we came down here, we had a set of specific tasks that we wanted to achieve. We really achieved most of those. And so now we've got time in the schedule to build on what we've learned, try some new things, try different techniques, using them together in combination in ways that we might not have thought of previously. Uh, experiment, take advantage of the opportunity. We're down here, we got everything dialed in, we've really found the groove, we know what we're doing, we're doing it well, and so now we can try a bunch of different things and uh, see what works. You're already implementing some of the lessons you've learned here. Exactly. Before this is even over. Well, Steve, good yeah. luck with the rest of the mission. We appreciate your uh, taking a few minutes to bring us up to speed on what's going on. Thanks very much, enjoy doing it. NEMO 16 crew member Dr. Steve Squires of Cornell University. And you can find out a lot more about what Steve and his crewmates have been doing on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. They have blog posts and pictures, the whole thing. You can check it out on their website at nasa.gov slash NEMO.